Welcome to the newscast. I'm Paul Yee. Let's start with the headlines. High-level diplomats from South Korea, the United States and Japan are set to gather in the capital Seoul tomorrow. The two-day meeting will be focused on North Korea's nuclear weapons program and ways to bring back Pyongyang back to the six-party talks. A leading American scholar is putting the pressure on Japan yet again for attempting to whitewash the country's wartime history. This time, the scholar is calling Tokyo out for seeking UNESCO World Heritage status for industrial facilities that use Korean slave labor during World War II. And thousands of temples across Korea are celebrating the birth of Buddha today. We take a look at the message delivered by the leader of the country's largest Buddhist sect, who is using this holiday to spread a message of peace and reconciliation on the peninsula. The chief nuclear envoys of South Korea, the United States and Japan will meet in Seoul this week to discuss ways to denuclearize North Korea. The meeting will likely be focused on ways to step up pressure on Pyongyang in order to return to the negotiating table. Our Kim Min-ji starts us off. The chief nuclear envoys of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will be in Seoul on Tuesday to share their assessments of the recent situation in North Korea and its nuclear threats. The two-day meeting will involve Korea's top nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, and his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Sung Kim and Junichi Hara. The three serve as delegates to the long-stall six-party talks on denuclearizing North Korea. Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry says the three will seek to make substantial progress in the North Korean nuclear issue through deterrence, pressure and dialogue. The trilateral talks come at a time of growing uneasiness about the situation in North Korea. Pyongyang recently claimed it successfully test-fired a ballistic missile from a submarine and said it now has the capability to miniaturize nuclear weapons, a crucial step toward building nuclear-tipped missiles. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un also reportedly had Defense Minister Hyun Young-chul executed, raising doubts about his grasp on power. Meanwhile, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo are seeking to take action against the regime at the U.N., saying that the recent test firing is a violation of U.N. resolutions. The last meeting between the three countries was held in January in Tokyo, where they agreed that the North should first demonstrate it is sincere about denuclearization before returning to the six-party talks. The talks involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, were last held in December 2008. Kim min Arirang News. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is likely to visit China in September to attend an event marking the 70th anniversary of the Allied victory over Japan. That's according to Xu Guangyu, a retired major general in the People's Liberation Army, who says the event, a military parade hosted by President Xi Jinping, is of great political significance. In an interview with Hong Kong-based Phoenix Satellite TV, Xu added that if Kim does not turn up, it could complicate matters with China, and he may have to pay a price. If Kim does, does attend, it would be the first overseas trip for him since he assumed power after his father's death in 2011. The defense expert added that if Kim could use the visit as a way to, Chinese, to get garner Chinese support in the six-party talks or on nuclear issues. There are many questions surrounding North Korea on the stability of its regime and its military provocations. Our Hwang Sung-hee sat down with former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, Donald Gregg, for his insight on the reclusive state. You visited North Korea last year, and, the, and your previous visit was when Kim Jong-il was in power. So did you sense a difference in tone among the North Korean officials there? I sensed a big difference. I had last been there in 2008 with the New York Philharmonic. And I went uh, last February. Uh, Kim Gae Gwan had been my usual contact. He'd been promoted, and so I de dealt with Ri Young Ho. I said, I think we make a terrible mistake in not talking with you. Mm -hmm. And he said, Well, we don't think President Obama is going to talk to us. Uh, he's got enough on his plate. So we'll just wait until there's an American president who is willing to talk. And in the meantime, the sky is the limit for us under Kim Jong un. Now, I'd never heard anybody say that before. And Pyongyang itself looked very good. Uh, people were wearing better clothing. Everybody seemed to have a cell phone. And I could tell that the North Koreans were very proud of what they are accomplishing and are very optimistic about what they will accomplish in the future.
You once mentioned in an interview of a chance that Kim Jong-un could have been educated in the U.S. Do you think this was a missed opportunity? When he came, uh, first surfaced in North Korea, uh, I knew he had been uh, educated in Switzerland, was a basketball nut, a great fan of the Chicago Bulls. And so I wrote uh, Vice President Biden saying, here's a young man who's going to be around for decades. Here's a chance to bring him to the United States, uh, show him around. I added in my letter, they may not accept it, but they'll never forget the fact that it was offered because it was an offer of respect. And we do very, very little of that with the North Koreans. And I think it was a real missed opportunity. Secretary Kerry recently spoke of more sanctions on North Korea. Do you think this is the right time to put more pressure on North Korea? We've recently learned that North Korea is selling a great deal of anthracite coal to China, and China is paying hard currency to them. That's their largest source of hard currency, and that they are doing it in ways that don't register on the sanctions. So I don't think the sanctions are very effective. They hurt the little people, and they haven't stopped a major flow of hard currency from China into North Korea. The Obama administration has been making efforts to mend ties with Iran and Cuba. Could North Korea be next on President Obama's list? I wish that uh, Obama would reach out to North Korea, but I don't think he will because he's under fire from the Republicans already for reaching out to Cuba and Iran. And we have demonized North Korea to the extent that there's absolutely no political support on anybody's part urging President Obama to reach out to North Korea. If he did it, he would be moving solo. So I think it would be a very difficult move for Obama to make against the feeling that's rampant in the United States that, that Kim Jong-un is, is going to collapse. And I don't think that's going to happen. We're going to be dealing with him for a long time, and the sooner we start, the better. Thank you, Ambassador, for your time today. My pleasure. And on a lighter note, in a message marking Buddha's birthday, President Park geun renewed her commitment to revitalize the economy and reform the country. The message was delivered by Culture Minister Kim Jong-dog at a Buddhist ceremony at Seoul's Chogesa Temple on Monday. The president called for national reconciliation through Buddha's teachings of wisdom and mercy, adding that the government will make every effort to bring happiness to the people. The speech comes as the president struggles to overhaul the pension program for civil servants while continuing her deregulation drive and efforts to eradicate corruption. Today is a special day for Buddhists in Korea. It's Buddhist's birthday. It's his 2,555th for those who are keeping track. Hundreds of people in Seoul, from the faithful to the curious, celebrated the occasion at Chogesa Temple. Connie Kim was there and brings us this report. It's celebration to mark Buddha's birthday. Hundreds of people made their way to Chogesa Temple to hear the celebratory message delivered by the head of the Choge Order of Korean Buddhism, the largest Buddhist sect in the nation. In this year's message, the Venerable Chasun commemorated the 70th anniversary of Korea's independence from Japanese colonization and called on the two Koreas to build trust through exchanges. It is painful that the two Koreas have been confronting each other for the past 70 years. We must end this conflict. The Choge Order is proposing three pathways to reunification, coexistence, harmony and united minds. He added the reunification of the two Koreas is no longer just Korea's wish, but the wish of people around the world. Yearning for peace and the reunification of the two Koreas, a joint South and North Korea prayer was presented for the first time in four years. Those who came out on this special day also participated in the bathing of the Buddha ritual, in which they pour water over a statue of a baby Buddha to pray for peace, wellness and for their wishes to come true. I'm praying for the well-being of our family, for everyone to be healthy, and my friends and relatives to prosper. Everyone who made the trip to one of the 20,000 Buddhist temples around the country today seemed to have the same purpose, to be happy and enjoy the sunshine on what was a beautiful spring day. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
Now, it might be a public holiday for the vast majority of people in Korea, but one person who will be busy working is Prime Minister nominee Hwang Gyo An as he prepares for his upcoming confirmation hearing. If Hwang is confirmed, and analysts say President Park Geun hye will have fresh impetus to forge ahead with her reform drives. Our Chi Mung Gil has more. A motion will be sent to the National Assembly on Tuesday to ask for a confirmation hearing for Prime Minister nominee Hwang Gyo An. The nomination requires a parliamentary endorsement, and Hwang is expected to undergo a tough confirmation session within the next couple of weeks. I will fully explain any suspicions surrounding me at the hearing. Whether Hwang passes the confirmation hearing remains unclear, given the main opposition party's resistance to the prosecutor turned justice minister. We don't know how the prime minister nominee will be able to look after state affairs amid claims of real estate speculation, evading military service, and receiving a lawyer's fee of over one million U.S. dollars. The ruling's Henry Party has called for a thorough probe into Hwang's credentials to avoid the potential embarrassment of him suffering a similar fate as his predecessor Lee Wan Gu, who was forced to step down over allegations of corruption. We urge the opposition to avoid making the confirmation hearing a tool for political attacks and focus on verifying the nominee's capabilities and qualifications. President Park Geun-hye's choice is interpreted as reflective of her push to fight corruption, as well as her major deregulation drive to help revive the stagnant economy. The parliament is required to hold confirmation hearings and a vote for the nominee within 20 days of a motion being filed. The prime minister is the only cabinet post that requires parliamentary approval. Jim young Arirang News. Health officials say that some of the people who are quarantined after coming into close contact with the first person in the country to be diagnosed with Middle East Respiratory Syndrome could be released as early as Tuesday. The Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says the people are being cleared for release have not shown any symptoms of fever or coughing for the past two weeks, which is the virus's incubation period. Health officials also say chances are pretty low that the virus will spread to the wider population because it is not contagious for someone who's shown no symptoms of the disease during the incubation period. Three people in Korea have contracted the disease. The first is receiving treatment for pneumonia, while the other two are in stable condition. An American professor is urging Japan to set the record straight on its history for wartime industrial facilities. Tokyo is attempting to enlist them as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Our Son Jung-in reports. Alexis Dutton is one of the coordinators who led the landmark signing of a statement earlier this month that calls on Japan to accurately address the history of its colonial rule and wartime aggression, including its sexual enslavement of women. The University of Connecticut professor is now criticizing Japan for its attempt to enlist its wartime industrial facilities as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. She stressed that the Shinzo Abe administration should first make public the facility's sad history. The Japanese government's effort to do so come, uh, come together with an honest accounting of what happened at especially, I believe it's six or seven of the sites that relied very heavily on Korean slave labor. International efforts to stop Japan from whitewashing history started with a similar statement signed by 20 historians in February, with the number of supporters having now grown to nearly 500. The statement highlights the sexual slavery issue in particular, and Dutton says the reason for that is not only because of Japan's efforts to distort history, but also because it is an affront to all the women who suffered during and after World War II. This seems to be the one that has been most politicized this past year. When the Japanese government uh, had attempted to censor an American textbook. Dutton says the scholars are also receiving support from many Japanese citizens who want to be part of the movement to set the record straight. Now, it remains to be seen how Abe, who once said that controversial historical disputes should be left to the historians, will respond to the growing criticism raised by the historians themselves. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Historical records on Japan's wartime sex slaves or comfort women have now become national heritage in China. 
China's media reported Monday the State Archives Administration recently declared a set of 29 written documents on the issue as national heritage after nine archive bureaus in China applied for the listing in 2013. The so-called comfort women documents include confessions by Japanese war criminals who admitted to turning Chinese homes and buildings into military brothels during the 1937 Nanjing massacre. A bureau representative stressed the importance of these documents, saying that most of the victims who could have served as witnesses to Japan's wartime atrocities have passed away. Now switching gears, more Chinese money is making its way into Korea's financial market, and experts predict that China will surpass the U.S. this year to become the largest investor in Korean bonds. According to data by the Financial Supervisory Service, Chinese investors bought a net 1.8 billion U.S. dollars worth of Korean bonds in the first four months of this year, while U.S. investors' net purchase was just over $154 million. Market watchers say the sharp rise is in line with China's efforts to diversify the use of its foreign exchange reserves. U.S. investors' holdings remain unchanged at just over 18 percent of the total. Chinese investors' holdings, on the other hand, soared at 27.6 percent from the previous year, raising their share to 16.3 percent. Now, it's normally Korea's female golfers that score major victories in the sport, but a young Korean man has shocked pretty much everybody by winning the European flagship event, the BMW PGA Championship at Wentworth. 23-year-old An Byung-hoon put in a stunning final round at the 7-under-65 at the world-famous British course, meaning the finished on a 21-under and beat the previous tournament record by two shots. The golfers in joint second finished at six shots behind the young Korean, picking up the trophy and his winner's check of 915,000 U.S. dollars. An said the victory was life-changing as it gives him the right to play in other elite events. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. More coming up later at 10 p.m. Korea time. Stay tuned.